Valley Center, and I want to welcome all of you. My first contact with our guest speaker today, um, he had been conducting a study abroad workshops in Brasago, Switzerland, for a number of years. And when we started to think about doing uh, workshops, master designer workshops with Minelli, I knew about that, and I called up. I called him up, and I asked him for his advice. And he gave me a whole list of great ideas, and we implemented them with uh, Massimo Vignelli in the south of France, on the French Riviera, which sounds pretty nice today, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, so his suggestions were very helpful and made the workshops a success. So thank you for that, Philip. You've probably forgotten about it, but there it is. Um, our guest uh, divides his time between teaching and practicing graphic design, and that really is a challenge. He started his teaching career at the University of Houston, and has also taught at Rice University School of Architecture, Yale University School of Art, and is now a professor of design in the School of Art and Design at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Between 1975 and 1996, he was the coordinator and one of the core faculty of the five-week summer design workshop in Brasago, Switzerland, which I mentioned. That was sponsored by Yale University. And since 1992, he has been a consultant in corporate design for Morningstar Incorporated, a, financial, a global financial investment research company. In 2003, he was named a fellow of the American Institute of Graphic Arts. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome <laughs> Philip Burton. Thank you. What Roger failed to mention is that uh, we actually met each other in person in 1998 in Breckenridge, Colorado. We were not there to ski, we were there to talk about Paul Rand. Uh, Roger talked about the historical significance of Paul Rand. Uh, I talked about Paul Rand the teacher because we taught together at Yale University. I was terrible that day, absolutely terrible. And then George at Balance uh, had, was a former student at Yale, student of, Ran of Rand's at Yale, and she had organized a retrospective of his work at uh, the Herbal Ballon Gallery at Cooper Union. So Roger and I broke away from the group and went into town, snuck into town, and we bought these cool cowboy belts, you know. Uh, and I was gonna wear mine today, but, but for some reason it's a little shorter than it used to be <laughs> in 19... <laughs> and Roger's, and Roger's is too. Uh, I was here at the opening of this magnificent facility. You are, if you don't know it already, you are in the hands of uh, one of the most important people in graphic design. You have uh, a, a worldwide reputation here. You have somebody who, it seems to me, single-handedly was able to convince a lot of people to build this. Uh, and he brings great people like me <laughs> to talk to you. So um, I'm going to start out by telling you that I grew up in, uh, if you can't hear me, tell me, and I'll use the microphone, but, but I'm hoping I don't have to do that. I like to walk around. I was born in, um, and grew up for four years anyway, in a little town in Michigan. Uh, and actually, when I was four years old, uh, that was 68 years ago. My parents bought a television. That's not me at the television, and that's not the television. But televisions were a new thing. And it was this great big box filled with these tubes inside, these light bulb tubes that were very hot and smelly, uh, with a little tiny screen like that. We became very popular in the neighborhood, and everybody would come over to watch television. There were maybe three shows on in the evening. It was Milton Berle, Dinah Shore, uh, and Gary Moore, you know. And, and uh, ads by cigarettes, ads for cigarettes, Lucky Strike. There was this person in this Lucky Strike 
box that would dance around, you know, and that was the commercial, all in black and white. So this particular model has um, a radio on the side. Ours didn't have a radio, but it, it has three buttons. I mean, I don't remember three buttons. I remember one button, you turn it on, you turn it off. The other button is probably for the volume. Maybe the third one is for changing the channel. And that was it. Last Friday, I live in Chicago. Uh, and last Friday, I had a new television installed. It's a c complicated story. But I had a new television installed. And it looks something like this. <laughs> I don't know the exact size, but it's, it's very big. And the person who um, installed the television for me had to give me the remote control and give me lessons in how to use the remote control. The remote control, which I'm still trying to learn, the remote control has 50 buttons. It's a regular size remote control. 50 buttons. 50. So Roger sent me this email back in July. You know, anybody will agree to come to Rochester in the winter if they're invited in July. And this is the, <laughs> this is the, this is the, the key sentence. Topic is up to you, but since we are among the few remaining graphic design formalists around, formalists. You know, I thought, <laughs> I know what formalism is, but, you know, what does that mean to me? Why, why am I a formal, formalist? And why am I one of the few remaining? That's the scary part. <laughs> uh, and maybe uh, something with Swiss reference would be in order. So I think that what Formalism is, is the one button, the one button television. You know, turn it on, turn it off. It is a, a foundation upon which, if you're a graphic designer, you build your career. Roger uh, wanted a title, so I made one up from Mauerstrasse to Wall Street, I lived in, I studied in Switzerland. I lived in Switzerland for five years. You're going to see a little bit of that. And um, the word Mauer means wall, so I just made it up. Mauerstrasse, there is no Mauerstrasse in my <laughs> model. So it's from Wall Street to Wall Street, um, a designer's journey. There is really a Wall Street. It's in New York City, and it's probably a very active place today. So not unlike... Um, most people who pursue careers in graphic design. Uh, mine was just like that. My parents, I, you know, I would do little paintings and drawings and things. They put them on the refrigerator. And then one day in third grade, the teacher needed somebody to make a sign for the library. And so I, you know, volunteered. Uh, and I went home and I got a piece of paper and I got my colored pencils. And I, I did this. Uh, this, is, this, is n this is not the, the sign. This is a recreation of the sign uh, done from memory. And I, uh, these, by the way, uh, these, these letters that sort of go off into the distance like that, I called those my Superman letters, you know. <laughs> Superman was the big uh, show on television, you know, when I was in third grade. So, but I learned two things from this. Um, the first thing is, is that you have to work together with a writer or a proofreader <laughs> because I had spelled the word library wrong, you know, so I had to do the sign again. So I also learned that you have to keep doing things again and again until you get them right. But the most important thing I learned from this is uh, that I fell in love with, with letters. I fell in love with, with drawing letters, you know. I didn't know that my whole life would be amount, it wouldn't, it would amount to that, but that's what happened. This um, sign for the library uh, promoted me to the bulletin board, and my specialty was daffodils made with cupcake papers. I told this story <laughs> to a student of mine, and he did this wonderful 
um, little drawing for me of this cupcake paper thing. So I had um, a, a brother who was 16 years older than me, and he was um, an advertising executive in New York City. And so, and he led a very glamorous, what I thought was a very glamorous and cool life, you know. Um, he used to date uh, Carol Burnett, and um, uh, they called one New Year's Eve, and she said, I'm going to send you my champagne glass, you know, and that was the beginning of my drinking glass collection. I have this huge drinking glass collection because of Carol Burnett. But I said, I want to major in advertising. You know, I want, to, I want to do what my brother did. And this was advertising at the time. You don't have to be Jewish to love Levy's. I mean, I don't know that you could get away <coughs> with a campaign like this today. But this, these, these posters were, and ads were very popular, were very famous. They were done by an ad agency in New York called Doyle, Dane, and Birnbach. And so I said, you know, this is what I want to do. I'm, I'm, I'm going to live at home because I have no burning desire to leave home. I get along fine with my parents. They were very supportive of me. And so I live at home and go to the Philadelphia College of Art in downtown Philadelphia. And they had an advertising program. Philadelphia at that time was also the home of NWR, which was uh, said at the time to be the largest advertising agency in the world. And so the faculty was made up of uh, the art directors and designers at NWR, and one of them, probably the most famous, was this guy named Raymond A. Ballinger. And he wrote books on <coughs> advertising. Uh, on layout and on direct mail and on lettering, stuff like that. It also happened to be uh, a wonderful coincidence for me that the person who gave the welcoming speech <coughs> to the incoming class, I was in the class of 1968, was Bill Birnbach of Doyle, Dana Birnbach. I said, you know, I'm in heaven, this is great, you know, what could be better than this? So, and this is what advertising amounted to at the time. On the right hand page, you see a sketch for an ad for cigarette lighters. The connection to the kitten, I'm not quite sure. Uh, and you can see that this is a pencil drawing, and what's most important is that the type is indicated in pencil. You know, straight lines and little squiggles. And when I started to study advertising at the Philadelphia College of Art, that's one of the first things we learned. You go and you buy a soft pencil and you shave it with a razor blade, so that you can try to indicate type in the typeface in which it's supposed to be. I mean, you can see it never really worked out. But setting type at this time was a very expensive proposition, you know, uh, and you, unlike now, and you, you just could not have the type set for something like, for a sketch like this. You know, you had to indicate it this way. Um, at the top, uh, is the final ad with the cigarette lighter and the poor kitten. And I have uh, a piece of work uh, that I did then, just to give you an idea of the kinds of things that we were doing. Another art director from NWA, a guy named Richard Hood, taught us how to draw these letters. You know, so I was very happy. The yellow paper here is color aid paper. I don't know if you know what color aid paper is, but uh, for 60 some dollars you can buy this pack of paper. It looks like uh, wall paint has been sprayed or silk screened onto pieces of paper. It's what Albers insisted that all his students buy to do their, their color studies. Horrible stuff to work on. Um, and then I found that one, this wonderful uh, uh, gift wrap, you know, I thought this was really great, this pink day glow color you know, and I cut out this uh, ampersand. I, I drew all of these letters um, with a ruling pen and a ruling pen attachment in a compass. And I was told that I should explain to you what a ruling pen is. It's a very simple device. Uh, it's two blades with a little screw in between, and you can uh, change the distance between the two blades. You put some kind of liquid in between the two blades, 
and you draw straight lines. You put the ruling pen head into a compass and you can draw curvy lines. It's a wonderful, wonderful tool. Um, so I did all this with these, with these things. And then um, a couple uh, wonderful things happened. The first one is that I went to Europe for the summer, you know, the kind of summer where you travel around with a backpack and sleep on park benches and that kind of stuff. So I was able to go to <coughs> Paris, London, France, Bordeaux, and Madrid, Madrid for three, $333. <laughs> this was the summer of 1966. And the other thing that happened is um, that the um, dean of faculty at the Philadelphia College of Art, a guy named George Bunker, whose uncle was Ellsworth Bunker. The older members of the audience know Ellsworth Bunker for two reasons. He was the United States ambassador to Vietnam during the war, and he then renegotiated the Panama Canal Treaty when it needed to be renegotiated. And he decided that advertising art was not an appropriate discipline for a college, an art college that was continually seeking to improve their credentials. So he eliminated the advertising art program. And that's how you get rid of, if you're ever in this situation, <laughs> That's how you get rid of tenured faculty members. You say the program doesn't exist anymore, we don't need you. So they were gone, and I was in Europe. And George went to the Aspen Design Conference, there used to be a design conference in Aspen every summer, and he found this guy, Ken Hebert. And he brought Ken Hebert uh, back to Philadelphia, Ken Hebert was uh, teaching at Carnegie Mellon at the time, which was called uh, Carnegie Institute of Technology back then. And the program changed from advertising art to graphic design. I was uh, very impressed with Hebert's work, and I'm going to show you some of it. He was um, a devout Mennonite, he still is a devout Mennonite, Mennonites are conscientious objectors, and in lieu of going into the selective service, he went to Switzerland to work for the church. And he did that for five years, he and his wife. They had three daughters. And he um, took a drawing class at the local school. And the woman standing next to him said, you know, you're quite good at this. You might consider studying here. You know, maybe you could become a graphic designer, and that woman was Dorothea Schmid, who later, later became Dorothea Hoffmann, Armin Hoffmann's wife. So he studied uh, at the school in Basel for five years. That was, that was the regular course, five years. One year uh, introductory, four years regular. So this is um, one of the logos that he did for the Mennonite Church, and for me, it was more mystical, magical, intriguing than the Indian and the cop eating a piece of bread. He then uh, used this on a cookbook for the Mennonite Church. He did this little um, business card for James Knox, and I <coughs> was especially intrigued with this because he has a J and a K. He's created this J and K within this square, turned on its point. And uh, it's, you know, it's like a floor plan for a building. You know, how appropriate is that for an architect? This is one of a series of books called Critical and Historical Commentaries on the Bible, which were done for Fortress Press. And, uh, you know, this is the word hermenia on the cover, but what was especially interesting for me were the inside pages. You know, this is heavy-duty stuff, historical and critical commentaries on the Bible. And he was able to take all these different categories of information, sometimes in Hebrew, required to have footnotes on the page where they appeared, created a grid, actually it's two grids overlapping each other, 
to uh, clarify this information and give these pages an enormous life with this, this dense information, with this beautiful typography. There are no two pages that were the same, you know. Uh, there was always some different composition of the information on the pages. Two more things. This was the cover of an annual report at the school while I was there. And you might look at it and say, well, what's the big deal, you know? Well, the big deal is that he created his own exclamation point so that the, the there's this point, uh, sharp point coming into this curvilinear uh, object here. The other thing there is actually a question mark. Uh, it looks a little bit like Cooper Black, designed in the 20s by Oswald Cooper in Chicago. And then you see these, these splatters, you know, and you're saying, ho-hum, splatters, you know, we see splatters every day. But in 1963, you didn't see splatters. No, it wouldn't have been 63. It would have been more like 67, 68, you know. And then on the inside, he had this beautiful photograph of the facade of the building. You know, I showed you a picture of the facade of the building. There's four columns. That was uh, Bucks County sandstone or something like that. It became the symbol of the school. So he's photographing this thing. So you see a hint of the cylinder in the upper right, and it really turns into this rectilinear, beautiful rectilinear shape, you know, juxtaposed against this little sliver of light coming through. And here you can see the, the uh, stronger cylindrical quality of the, of the column, you know, and I, I, I had never seen anything like this. I thought, th I thought this was terrific that you could take a photograph and do something like this with it. One more example, there was a um, music festival in Philadelphia one summer. This is the cover of the book. He did the, he did the entire program and he created this sunburst and if you look at it carefully, you don't even have to look at it there carefully, you can see <coughs> the uh, introduction of the different um, uh, parts of the musical instruments. So you have the sun, it's summer, music, here it is. But the inside was even better. You know, you have this black and white photograph on the left of these guitars with these beautiful curves. On the right, this is a pretzel vendor's cart. And you can see the pretzels <coughs> behind the jar of mustard. Uh, and they had this uh, octagonal opening with this red plastic or glass in it, you know. And he's, he's, and you have this color photograph juxtaposed against that black and white photograph there. You know, he's seeking to capture the essence of summer in Philadelphia. And finally, um, we have this spread, you know, a guy sitting down talking to his girlfriend, and the son is bathing his back, and he happens to have this white shirt on, you know, capturing, again, this idea of summer in the sunlight. I uh, am showing you his two books, you know, in case you are interested in following up on his work. Um, so he then brought a classmate of his from Basel, a Swiss guy named Stefan Geisbühler, to sort of reinforce the Basel influence in the program. Stefan, um, when he was finished with school in Basel, he worked for uh, the Geige Pharmaceutical Company. Pharmaceutical companies in Basel uh, employ 40% of the population. It's a big deal. We can thank them for Valium and Librium and birth control pills. In the Middle Ages, Basel was famous for ribbons and they would dye the ribbons these bright colors, and it was the dye that eventually turned into this pharmaceutical uh, industry. And he also did a poster uh, for the school with the PCA letters, and he um, worked for a little while for Richard Saul Werman at the architectural firm Murphy Levy Werman, Architecture and Urban Planning, and then he went to New York and he worked for Shermay von Geismar, 
uh, and worked on this uh, identity for the Environmental Protection Agency. There's a long story involved with this that I won't go into. And he cleaned up um, the peacock for NBC. So um, Hebert, as a teacher, um, was not always easy to understand. He had this metal lowercase Helvetica A about this tall that he would talk about all the time. You know, the, the form of the letter, the, the relationship of the inside of the letter to the outside of the letter, the, the conversation that's going on among the points in the letter, you know, and stuff like that. He would take us out to the front of the building and talk about the cracks in the sidewalk, you know. And at the time, you know, we didn't quite, we didn't quite get it. We thought that the, the cracks weren't in his, uh, in the uh, sidewalks, they were, they were in his head. So I'm going to show you a little bit of the work that I did when I was there. This is um, uh, my solution for a, an identity for the Theater of Living Arts in Philadelphia, a theater on South Street that was very, very avant-garde. And so now I've gone from library and, and uh, other manifestations of letters to these very abstract things, you see, these, these bars and dots that come together to make these letters and to make the, this, the, this theater, the different aspects of the theater, you know, and I thought, well, maybe this is also looking down on a stage set or something like that. And these shapes can be moved around in different configurations. So then, I don't know if you can see this or not, and this is also a recreation, recreation from, from memory. I, I built these things out of, uh, well, all kinds of things, out of balsa wood mainly, you know, and painted them white and photographed them to sort of uh, investigate, you know, the idea of three-dimensionality and to, to sort of propose this idea that these were elements of a theater that could, that could move around. My dad had a, an extensive um, collection of tools, and uh, we're getting to the climax. Uh, and so we were to bring in uh, objects and uh, make some kind of uh, uh, composition. And we did this using a paint called Placa that's, that's made by the Pelican Company in Germany. Placa is a tempera paint that is water soluble until it dries and then it's perfectly waterproof. And so you can paint black on top of white and white on top of black back and forth, you know, until you get just the right form. You can thin it down a little bit and put it in a ruling pen, you know. So I thought, well, you know, this is, this is really great. So then Hebert came in to conduct a critique and he put a piece of tracing paper on top and with a soft pencil he made these lines. He didn't say a word, he just made these lines. And then he took the paper away to reveal this. And in a manner not unlike taking the shapes to try to put them together to form TLA, my eyes and my world were opened up to this idea of abstraction and seeking to, to capture the, the essence of this thing with these few lines. So um, I was uh, not hooked yet, but this was the thing that really hooked me. This guy named Armin Hoffman came to visit the class. Um, he had been Hebert's teacher, he had been Geisbühler's teacher. He was in Philadelphia because he had appeared at some conference, design conference in New York City. And he came into the room and he sat down on a folding chair like this and he had a daily paper. And he unfolded it and put it in front of him and talked about the banality of it. And then he unrolled a poster that he had brought with him to show us the Spitzen poster. Spitzen means lace. And this is a poster for an exhibition at the Gewerbe Museum in Basel. 
uh, poster that Armin had did, and he started to explain why he had done this and what his thinking was, you know, and so he talked about these little <coughs> V-shaped elements that go around the two edges of the photograph and how he had drawn these letters and overlapped these letters to create a similar kind of activity on the other two edges of the poster. So, you know, I was totally over the top by this time and had no choice but to go to Basel to study. We're standing on top of the cathedral in Basel. You see the Rhine on the right coming from the east where it separates uh, Germany from Switzerland. Uh, Basel is the location where it turns and goes north, separating Switzerland from France, or Germany from France, sorry. That black rectangle in the center is a hotel, and uh, at the time it was built, it's 30 stories tall. I live in a building that's 30 stories tall. It was the tallest building in Switzerland. But that changed because of the longer, or the taller rectangle further to the right, that's the first of three buildings for the uh, La Roche, which is also a pharmaceutical concern. The La Roche offices designed by <coughs> Basel architects Herzog and Demelon. So off to Basel I went. This is a picture of the school. The school is no longer at this location, but it was at the time. The column in the center of the courtyard was designed by Jean Arp and executed by the guy who was our sculpture teacher. This little configuration of squares, turning squares, um, we called that Monkey Mountain. That's where you can see where we would sit because there was a canteen inside the building uh, away from that little thing there. That was part of Armin's design. And at the same time that I arrived in Basel, which was the spring of 1970, um, an issue of Graphis came out, issue number 146. And I can tell you, if you're at all interested <laughs> in Graphis, um, you can become a member of Graphis and you can um, access every single issue that they have ever published and you can see every single page of every single issue. It's amazing. But this was um, the spring of 19. 70, as I said, and the entire issue was devoted to a comparison between the Royal College of Art in London and the Kunstgewerbeschule in Basel. And this is the, the uh, these are the pages that represent the work being done at the Royal College of Art at the time. You can see that the work is of a more illustrative nature. You know, I just have a couple spreads here, you know, compared to the Kunstgewerbeschule in Basel. That's Emil Ruder in the uh, upper left-hand corner and what the little type says there. I think I have a little red thing. I don't know if it'll work. No, it doesn't work. Um, in the type it says, as this issue was going to press, we were saddened to learn of the death of Emil Ruder. So uh, I was not in the normal class. I was in a refresher course a Weiterbildungsklasse. Um, and Armin and Dorothee Hoffman had helped to develop the curriculum at the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad, India, together with Ray and Charles Eames and, and Louis Kahn. Uh, Armin was teaching at Yale. Uh, and so kids came from all over the world to study as part of this program. This is a typical Armin Hoffman exercise. You can see it's about as far away from the illustrative nature of the Royal College of Artwork as you possibly can be. The students would create these grids and then uh, devise ways of uh, changing them or interacting with them. You know, it could be as simple as something like cutting out an equilateral triangle and twisting it a little bit. So uh, this was, the teacher is Max Schmid. He was uh, a, an art director or in charge of design at Siva Geige, another one of these pharmaceutical companies. And this is a 
safety symbols and safety signs that the students did for factories. The third row down, um, especially that, that skull that's turning into a liquid, they were done by Dan Friedman. I don't know if you know Daniel Friedman, but they were done by Daniel Friedman. Um, this was Andre Gertler, the lettering teacher. He had helped Frutiger design Univers and um, to really prepare us for designing, I mean, this is the real thing now, this is not li library anymore. To prepare us for designing the real thing, we had to create little styluses that we would poke into clay in a manner like cuneiform. We would have to scratch letters uh, into um, uh, slate shingles, you know, to sort of recreate uh, the way letters had been made, and then we would do stuff like this investigating what uh, a serif is, you know, what can you do with serifs, what can one do with serifs, and drawing letters where they are uh, being italicized in, in wildly different directions and different angles. Uh, this was the film class taught by uh, Peter von Arx. Um, this was a sign and color class taught by the painter Franz Ferrier, and then the sculpture class over there on the right, that was Johannes Perla. So we, the classes were from 8 in the morning till 9 at night. We had two hours for lunch. On Monday, we had drawing with Kurt Howard, film with Peter von Arx that went until 9. On Tuesday, we uh, studied with Armin, group and individual projects. You know, the projects were determined between the teacher and the student. In the afternoon, we had access to the photographer, Max Matis. On Wednesday, drawing a different kind of drawing with Kurt Howard, typography with Wolfgang Weingart that went until 9. Thursday, design systems with Max Schmid, typography at night. On Friday, we had uh, uh, all day, we had type design with Andre Gertler. Friday nights were free. Saturday morning until noon, we had typography. Uh, unless you were a special student like me, and then you got to work in the type shop for the rest of the day. Sunday, uh, there were no classes, but uh, again, because of the projects that I was working on in typography, I got to work there all day. A uh, typical uh, project with Armin Hoffman is combining a letter and a number. You know, this is not a, a K and a 3, it's a T and a 3. And of course, all this stuff was painted by hand using a ruling pen, using this pocket paint. Then we would create a company for it, you know, because of the nature, the kind of sharp nature of the, or a sharp aspect of the 3, I created these cutting, this cutting company, three different kinds of cutting instruments, you know. These are razor blades. <laughs> That's what a razor blade looked like back in the 70s. Uh, and, and then when I was finished with that, uh, Armin sat down at my desk and he looked out the window at the German train station and he said, uh, using the colors that you see out there, uh, create a color study for the train station, you know, the activity of the, of the trains, you know. Uh, the kind of drawing that we did on Wednesday mornings with Kurt Howard. This is also black and white placa. Uh, it was uh, called uh, uh, translation, Übersetzung, Umsetzungen. And what we were doing was translating what we saw uh, into a, a black and white uh, uh, rendition of the thing, you know. And in the process, we were seeking to um, define the form and the nature of the material and how these different materials would would interact with each other. These are the pages that represented Weingart's class. Um, I was telling Roger and Anne earlier today, um, we did this thing called the podcast that the first Wednesday afternoon that I was in Weingart's class and he showed work of previous students, um, it changed my whole life. I know that sounds a little dramatic, but you know, he was showing us uh, things that could be done with typography, the likes of which I had never seen before. This is an unfolded package for Kleenex tissues called Linsoft. So, Ruder was a friend of Frutiger. Frutiger sent truckloads of type to Basel to work with. This is foundry type. This is this is. These are pieces of metal in those little shallow drawers that have all those little compartments. If we ever wanted to, if we ever needed type for any of our projects, you know, we would have to set it by hand. And Weingart had given us the task to 
uh, create a, a, a device for the trans-European uh, trains. And the trans-European trains were first-class trains that would travel among major cities in, in Europe. Uh, and we could only use material that was uh, in, in the type shop, type or dingbats or rule material or little squares or little dots, and we could only use stuff that was there. And, you know, so we collected hundreds of these things. Um, I, I did a poster first, uh, which enabled me to get a taste of letterpress printing. And then I did a couple hundred more of these things, and we said, what the hell are you going to do with all these TE things? It was decided that I would do a book that would typographically describe a journey from uh, Basel to Milan. Uh, you have a wonderful letterpress facility here. You know, I don't know if you use it or it's just a museum or what it is, but, but you, if you know anything about letterpress, uh, about, yeah, about letterpress printing, and, and uh, this kind of typography, you know that um, this is all, these are all pieces of lead and the spaces that go in between the letters are pieces of lead. You know, so you have this, this vertical horizontal limitation. So something like those diagonals there that are maybe a half a point rules have to be um, composed, set, and then locked into the bed of the press at an angle so that you could print something like that. Uh, Armin Hoffman um, wrote the foreword for this thing, and um, he talks in here about going from the areas north of the Alps to the south of the Alps. I mean, you can sort of read a little the first first paragraph and the last paragraph and get an idea. Uh, going from uh, pine trees and sausage to palm trees and spaghetti, you know, how the, the warmth of the sun had always beckoned to the people in the north. You might also notice that in the English version, the type gets smaller as it goes down. That's because there wasn't enough type in the drawers to compose the whole thing, so the type had to get smaller, so the letting had to be adjusted for those of you who know anything about typography had to be adjusted so that the overall texture and color <laughs> was the same. Uh, there are four two-page spreads. The size of these pages, by the way, are 12 by 12. And we leave Basel at 7.37 in the morning. Uh, we have these bars that are in different colors to represent the international quality of Basel. The Bank for International Settlements is in Basel. That means that every transaction that involves money in the world has to go through Basel. There are little diagonal um, rules that are uh, also composed and locked into the bed of the press at an angle, represents rainy Basel, you know, misty Basel. There were not enough to print them all on the left-hand page, so they had to be printed in rows. We arrive in Zurich at 841, leave at 850. We go through the flatlands of Basel, Zug, Arth Goldau. You can see that there's a TEE up there that looks a little bit like fields. You can also see that there are three lighter yellow areas. Two of them are existing rule material. The one at the bottom was cut out of linoleum, which sort of opened up this whole idea of cutting linoleum and printing it. And then on the right, you see a, a TEE made of dots. If you look at it very, very carefully, the res resolution on this thing has improved considerably. But if you look at it very carefully, you can see that there are six-point periods printed in silver to represent the snow, the 10 inches that we're getting tonight. Um, then you go through the tunnel, the Gotard Tunnel, from Gershenen to Airolo. There are two TEEs here that are uh, composed using existing rule material. Um, the rest of the thing is uh, all linoleum cut. The reason why there are two blacks here, this is just, yeah, two blacks here. This is the original black ink and where these rules up here, the ends of these rules overlapped this black ink. They got a little darker and it wasn't very nice. So these shapes here were cut out of the original linoleum and printed in clear ink, similar to what 
you see in pieces of work of Professor Remington. And then we descend the um, mountains, Bellinzona, Lugano, Chiasso, Como, headed to Milano. You can see I found little wavy lines here that represent the lake district. There's a TEE up in the upper right. I don't need to tell you that. I suppose what's interesting here are the rays of the sun. And when you want a kind of curve like that, you know, it has to be embedded in plaster for that to work. And finally, we arrive in Milan, this sunny area that is beckoning to the people in the north to come down. This is entirely, almost entirely done in, in uh, linoleum. So uh, there's a, a little slide here that I wanted to show you. This, this little color translation thing uh, that I did of the train station when I was a student, I still do that kind of stuff. This is a view of Lincoln Park and the lake outside of my apartment. Uh, and I used it on the cover of a poetry book. <clears throat> the, the poems are by a, a friend of mine. He asked me to do it. I said, no. He asked again. I said, yes. We spent a year and a half working on this thing. And I did it in Baskerville, you know. I had never worked with Baskerville before. I thought that Baskerville somehow was appropriate for this guy's poems, and, um, and I also wanted to learn about Baskerville. I wanted to have the feeling of working with Baskerville. So um, as Professor Remington said, I um, didn't go to school and study design because I wanted to be a teacher. Even though I've been a teacher for the past 43 years, I studied design to because I wanted to be a designer, and I have designed things all along. Um, I had the uh, pleasure of uh, meeting Paul Rand in 1977 as part of the summer program that Professor Remington talked to you about, and it was uh, Paul Rand who invited me to teach at Yale. So we got to know each other pretty well, and um, I moved to Chicago in 1989, um, and he called me one day and said, I've just done a logo for a company in Chicago, and they're ruining it. So he gave me a, a telephone number, said, call this telephone number, and a guy named Joe will hire you. And he did. Um, the guy's name is Joe Mansueto, and when he was 24 years old, he had a, both an undergraduate and graduate degree from the University of Chicago. He worked for two years for the Harris Company, which is an investment banking company. And he made the observation that if a person was interested in investing in a stock, which they probably are not today, that there was a lot of information <coughs> that they could go to and find out all about the company in which they want, wanted to invest. If, on the other hand, a person wanted to invest in a mutual fund, which is a portfolio of stocks, and less volatile, um, there were not so many places they could go. You know, they had to go to a lot of different places and call people and so on and so forth. So he quit his job. He bought a personal computer. It's 1984. And in his bedroom, he started to put together a database of information he thought was essential for a person who wanted information on mutual funds. He borrowed some money from uh, his parents. He put an ad in Barron's, which is a weekly financial tabloid. He got enough people to subscribe that he could print the thing. Uh, I'm going to show you a video of him talking about his relationship with Paul Rand and this whole idea of designing a logo for the company. He uh, talks in here uh, about, uh, Rand says, what are your revenues? Joe says, $2 million a year. That was in 1991. Uh, I'm working on the annual report for last year, and the revenues this year were a billion dollars. So here's Joe. Yeah, so when I started back in uh, 1984, and I agreed to kind of get uh, many of the publications uh, out the door, uh, one of the things I really missed was had to do with design. I was so focused on putting a name in it together, um, writing computer programs, doing the marketing. So uh, what I did 
did is the most expedient thing possible. I found a designer around the corner from where I lived in Lincoln Park. Uh, at Sally's Coast, which I her address, it was very close to where I lived. Uh, and so she did the first uh, Morningstar logo, which I'm sure no one remembers. It's very forgettable. And I thought, um, we need to really kind of revamp our design for Morningstar. And the place to start uh, is with the logo. And as I think as you know, I'm involved in the IBM logo, the Next Computer logo, which I think is a great logo, um, UPS, a whole host of um, you know, incredible logos. And so, uh, I tracked him down. Um, I remember calling a designer in New York and asked uh, how I could get hold of Paul Rand. And uh, he told me that Paul Rand was dead. Um, so he lived you know, a couple of years at that point. But uh, I didn't take that, I didn't, that didn't stop me. I persevered. I kept uh, working and I finally tracked him down in Connecticut. Uh, and so I called him up and uh, told him that I'd like to have him design our logo. And he said, um, a very good email, you know, call me back later, quick. So I waited a few weeks, same thing, a very good email, you know, call me back later, quick. So finally I got there and said, what if I just fly out and meet with you? And then he totally changed his tone. He's like, oh, okay, you know, uh, yeah, you know, come out and say to me. And uh, so I went and did that. I never asked me at all about my star or, you know, who I was. It was all about art and, uh, you know, his experience as, as a designer. And so after the morning ends, and I'm on my way out, I think I ought to ask him maybe about the logo that he, you know, was going to do for us. And he said, oh yeah, Morningstar. And I said, oh, uh, it's 11 letters. Uh, can't think of any S. He said, okay, I'll get back to you on Friday. And uh, I said, uh, okay. And I, I said, well, you know, I've got a couple of requirements. You know, the first requirement is that I want the logo and the word Morningstar to be in one space, like Coca-Cola. I didn't want uh, a logo, a little graphic uh, device, plus the, the word. You know, two separate things. I wanted to make it in one space. He didn't like that. That's kind of he, he acquiesced. And then the other thing is, I said, this is something that's very important to me um, and my life work. And uh, I really want to hear best work ever. I know you've done all these deals at IBM, and uh, you know, this may not be as much for you as it for me, but I really want to hear best work ever. And and then I also thought I should ask him how much this is going to cost. You know, here I am, a crappy entrepreneur. And I said, how much do you charge for your work? And he said, what are your revenues? And I said, well, $2 million. He said, that would be $50,000. And uh, I said, fine. And it, it, he said, and half up front. And, uh, uh, you know, it seemed like an incredible deal to me. I mean, here was a $50,000 for logo that could be used through his entire history. It was a great deal. And I knew from reading his book that uh, the client should not bother the designer. They want to let the designer go and make uh, the friend group their designs. And, but after a couple months, I, you know, I kind of broke down and then Roger would call me a few weeks ago. And uh, he said, oh, I'm glad you called. You know, I just figured it out. Uh, you know, I spent months and months thinking of star logos. And I filled up you know, five or six books of logos with stars in them, and I got nowhere. And finally, I remembered what you told me about where the name came from. Walden, the sun, started the morning star, and he thought of a rising sun, uh, and then he said he got to a logo in Japan. So we prepared this little um, diagram to show you how this came about. Uh, <clears throat> with the exception of the O, these are the letters that Rand, desi Rand designed. You know, he said 11 letters, that's a lot, so he chose the sans serif ultra condensed uh, letters. And then uh, he tried, as Joe mentioned, he tried these different mnemonic devices with these little stars in here, you know, and then all of a sudden there's a big fat O to make a kind of formal confrontation between the two. And then finally um, you have this rising, rising sun thing. So this is a, a, a page of uh, data. Uh, if you're interested in stock, data, this is it. You go to a company called Value Line. This is <coughs> all the stuff that you need to know if you are, want to buy stock in the Brunswick Corporation, you know, and uh, I mean if you look at it, it's a typographic uh, catastrophe. You have different styles of type, you have different sizes of type, you have different ways of type. You have these, these, these fences that are 
seeking to identify these different locations. That page had uh, an influence on the early morning star page. This is not the first one, but it's an early page. And so this is an accumulation of data and an analysis of what one would need if they're interested in, as I said, a mutual fund. But again, there are these, these the different typefaces and you find all caps and there's sans serif and serif and all this stuff and these awful fences, you know? So in 1993, we had the opportunity to redesign the thing. <coughs> the typeface universe condensed in light and bold was chosen. There are, there are only two or three sizes here. It's all cap and lowercase. There are no all caps at all. And there is an underlying structure that seeks to clarify this information and clarify these, the, these different um, uh, areas of information without drawing all these little fences. The other thing that helped was justifying the uh, columns of type and the analysis and the type that you see at the top. Uh, that's what the page looked like in 1993. Uh, this is what it looks like today. Um, you can get it on your iPad because of the um, retina uh, resolution. It's very, very sharp. Um, so you can read it. Uh, you, you look at it and it's recognizable as a Morningstar page. You know, our, our identity has become the way we present financial data rather than um, Paul Rand's logo, you know, and uh, it's also saying this is what Morningstar thinks you need, you know. So what you do is you, you touch an area and it gets bigger in case you can't see it and you touch it again and we're drilling down now so that you get more and more detailed information about what this, this stuff means. Uh, this was uh, our first uh, electronic product. It was called uh, on disk and as bad as the uh, early pages were, this is probably even worse, you know. The success of the printed page, which was the flagship product at the time, was so popular that we bought the rights to Univers and we applied the same standards to uh, not only all the rest of the print products, but the beginning of these electronic products. So this page today looks like this. And one of the nice things about Morningstar is that um, we have created these little icons that you can read and understand what's going on in the stock market without reading pages and pages of numbers. Those little squares there, the, square, the squares with nine subdivisions, that's called the style box, you know, and that represents different sizes and volatilities of companies and uh, we have, I think on the next page, yes, I can show you this. Of course, we have products on the phone. You can see here that the style box is in lighter shades of green and red. We have three reds, we have three greens. And you can look at this thing, if you know what those squares mean, and you can see exactly what's going on in the stock market without reading one single number. You can also see the history of the stock market in the smaller ones there. And of course, you know, we have this. Here you see the style box on the watch. Uh, when Apple came out with this watch, we worked all night to, cr to create this product. <coughs> and um, we weren't really successful in getting different shades of red and green, and so we, we uh, realized these things in these uh, vertical lines here to get these three different shades of green, three different shades of red. So you push it over, and you get all the indexes, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, Standard & Poor's 500, NASDAQ, and you push it over again and you get all the different indexes of money around the world. We also have print products. Here's, here are the covers of uh, 10 of our annual reports. We, ca we became a public company in 2005, uh, and so of course by law we have to have an annual report. Uh, and we also used to have a magazine or a catalog, you know. Joe said, I think we should have a catalog, like Sears Roebuck, to explain to people what our products and services are. The bright red is PMS 185, for those of you know, who know what PMS colors are. It's the brightest <coughs> red printing ink. It was chosen by Paul Rand. And what we're saying here, not only with these designs, but with this use of red, is that we are different than all other 
global financial investment companies. You know, you are not going to see grandma and grandpa walking on the beach on any of our products or kids throwing their mortar boards, you know, in the, in the air. It's just not there. The inside of these magazines, this is just one sample. Um, not only do we show our products and explain our services, but we also highlight some of our clients around the world. We hire a photographer to go around and photograph them. We hire a writer to interview them. And I wanted to show you this page, uh, not only because of that, but also because of the rags. You know, and for those of you who don't know what that means, these vertical columns here are set in a style that's called flush left. It's straight on the left and ragged right. It's rag on the right. And, you know, designers tend to leave that rag up to a computer, and we do not. I used to conduct classes in good ragging, you know, and there is, I am happy to say that there is not uh, a paragraph of type that leaves the building that has not been ragged. It's a little bit more difficult with electronic products than, than it is with print. Design, we're very close to the end. Design has been uh, designated as one of the three core competencies of the company. Research, technology, and design. You know, uh, design is the vehicle that takes this complicated financial data and makes it easy for people to read and use. We have just moved into, not we haven't just moved, we moved 2008, we moved into our most recent building because um, it's a 5,000 person, 5,000 employee company with offices in 27 countries around the world. And we thought, you know, this is the chance not only to design our products, but to design the space in which we live. So we are in a 17-story building in the very center of Chicago. It's made out of glass. It was designed by Ralph Johnston, who works for Perkins & Will, which is this huge international architectural firm. And we were able to get uh, Ralph Johnston to do some things that he originally had not intended to do. Um, like this double floor space. This is the cafe where people eat their lunch. You can see that there's a training room down there in the center. Above that is the board room. Then there's a kitchen, their dining room. That piece of sculpture there, which is 12 feet wide, is done by the same guy who did the piece of sculpture that's behind you, <coughs> Harry Bertoya. Uh, this is, these are the worker floors. This furniture was all designed in Italy by a company called uh, uh, Unifor. Uh, this is the most recent floor. We took over the 14th floor. CBS has one through five. And we had most of the rest of it. The 14th floor we, we had for storage. And it's a different kind of design. We had these tables uh, designed with wheels on them. They go up and down. You know, these are the people who are designing all of our interactive products now. Uh, you have the raw floor. We, ha we have these little rooms where they can get together and uh, share their work with each other. I mean, a completely different idea of, of the working space. That's Morningstar. I'm going to end, you may or may not be happy to know, with some things from Armin Hoffman that I think, you know, get to the core of formalism, which is sort of what this is all about. Here's an ad for Knoll. You know, Knoll is not a sleazy company. You know, they make beautiful products, but then they pile them on top of each other and take a photograph of them and, and make this ad. This was done by Armin Hoffman for the Herman Miller collection. These are uh, the chairs that are produced by Herman Miller. He has, this is a kind of translation, if you will, of the size of those chairs at the top. Second to the top, you can see the Eames lounge chair. You know, but he is pu <laughs> putting them together in this, this, this rhythmical way, uh, you know, that, that not only shows you the versatility of these chairs, uh, but also the vitality uh, of the design of these things. This is, uh, and he did that 
with a poster for the Stadttheater Basel with these hands. I mean, these could just as easily be the chairs, you know, uh, flying up, up the, the, the format there. So, you know, this is a theater where you have dance and you have music and you have theater, you know. These are hands that represent all that. And then there's this also for the Stadttheater, the same kind of thing, the same kind of rhythmic quality uh, of these. This, these are just brush strokes, you see. You have S-T-A-D-T-T-H-E-A-T-E-R, you know. This is a poster by uh, Joseph Mueller Brockman. I'm sure you've all heard of Joseph Mueller Brockman. You find some ballerina, you throw her in the air, you take a picture of her, or you can do this. This is what Armin Hoffman did for the ballet Giselle. You know, it's not a ballerina, it's every ballerina, you know, and the, the letters Giselle, which he has designed, you know, are a, a ballerina also. And so you have a, a fuzzy dot in the body of the ballerina having a conversation with the hard edge dot on the eye in Giselle, you know, that dot for those of you who know anything about type, that dot is further away from the base of the eye than it should be. And finally, you know, you go out, you find some drunk, you drag him in, you put a crossbow in his hands, you do some hand lettering, William Tell, you know, done, you know, or you can do this. So these are works by a one button person. You know, and it's important, I think, to understand that one button and study that one button and realize what that is because when you leave here, you know, you're going to have to work and survive in the 50 button world. That's it. <laughs> Whoops. Do we do anything now? Q and A. I have a question. Yeah. So back in those early days in Basel, did you all have to have some faith that doing exercises with dots and lines was going to be meaningful, or did you know it then? We did not know it, but know we knew that we were in the hands of people who gave us that faith. Okay. We believed in them so much that we would have done anything because we knew that, the, that it had a happy ending. That's great to hear. <laughs> so how do you balance being a professor and being a practicing professor? It's the most wonderful job that anybody could have. Um, you know, it, it, uh, as I said, I didn't study design to be a teacher, I studied design to be a designer, and, and, and I'm not the kind of person who would have his own studio. That's just not my way. So this, this, I have freelance clients, but I, this Morningstar thing, you know, I'd like to go to a place, uh, you know, where I know the people and I know what we're doing and we're all doing it together. You know, we, we, we believe that we are empowering people to take control of their own money, you know. I get Social Security. At a certain point, you know, they, they stop taking money out and you have to start taking it. So I got this letter that says um, the money you're about to receive will cover 40% of what it costs to stay alive. Those weren't quite the words, but, <laughs> you know, and so you think, well, where's the other 60% come from? You know, and that's where Morningstar comes in. We seek to, to, to take the fear out of investing. We seek to, to show people <coughs> how to do it, you know so that it's relatively easy and successful. So I'm in that world, you know, and then I'm, I'm at school. So in the, in the 25 years that I've worked at Morningstar, all the designers in Chicago, Morningstar has hired 125 of my students. So I am able to see if what we're doing with them in the school is the right thing. You know, can they survive in this environment? And on the other hand, you know, when I'm at school, it gives me some kind of credibility that I'm a real designer, you know. And I think that the two, you know, you have the spiritual aspect of teaching and you have 
the reality of a place like Morningstar and you're able to bring them together. You know. It's, 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 uh, when I started working at Morningstar, there were 120 employees and three designers and a, a colossal amount of work to do. It's a brand new company. You know, there were all these products. And I'm not Chermai van Geismar. I'm not Ansbach Grossman, Grossman in Portugal. I'm not Lippincott and Margulies. You know, I'm just little old me. But I thought that if we designed one thing after another, just design one thing with all the integrity and honesty that you have, that eventually we would have an identity for Morningstar. And that's what happened. That's what happened. You know, so it's great. I, I'm really happy that I do both things. You know, I, I feel it's a lot of work, takes a lot of time. I'm exhausted most of the time, but it is, so it's a wonderful combination. You know, if I had to give up one or the other, I, I don't know which one it would be, and I don't know what I would do. Could you speak about your, your, new, your ongoing connection with Switzerland? Uh, at the university, in the School of Design at the University of Illinois at Chicago, we also have, we have an undergraduate program, we have a graduate program, but we also have a program at this school, a graduate program at this school in Basel, and this is actually the 10th year anniversary of that. Um, the, the school and the students who want to study at the graduate level in Basel apply to Basel. The faculty in Basel choose the students who are going to study there. Um, we know what their classes are. They know what our classes are. Both sets of classes have the same number. At the end of two years, the students in Basel get a master's. Actually, it's a, um, a uh, what is it called? MDES. It's a Master of Design from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Very, very unusual thing. But it's, uh, you know, it's not one of those situations where the, the, we felt like, well, we had to have some connection to some foreign country somewhere. I mean, this was very deliberate. We wanted, that we decided we wanted this place. We wanted what they do. <coughs> we wanted their faculty, you know, and it's worked out very well. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>